recent years, and with the advances in computer science, there has been a growing interest in physicists to reach out and try to study natural phenomena far beyond the usual topics of physics. This includes not only studying chemical reactions or biological systems, but also trying to explain some interesting phenomena that appear in social sciences, like cultural dissemination, formation of consensus, or emergence of corporations. In this video, we will analyze one of the most famous models for opinion formation and cultural dissemination, named the Axelrod model. Let's go! that society is something that cannot be explained just by attending to individual humans, or their cells, or even their atoms. It would be very stupid if a social scientist contacted a particle physicist to use some big chunk of a Lagrangian to try to compute every single atom of every single cell of every single human to try and see if that gives rise to a complex society. And even if that was the case, I don't think our computers could predict such random things as we see nowadays. But anyway, the point is, Systems with a large number of interacting individuals cannot be explained by just looking at those individuals, you have to look for the bigger picture. If you don't believe me, next time you're preparing yourself a delicious sandwich, try eating the bread first, and then the lettuce, and then the cheese and the ham. It's not gonna taste the same way, that's for sure. This property that big systems exhibit, in which a big number of aggregates produce different behavior than its single parts, is what complex scientists know as EMERGENCE! Don't worry, though the name might make you want to call an ambulance, it just states the fact that different interesting properties appear when we look at the system as a whole, and not just to its parts. In this video, we will center in the emergence of one property in society, which is the dissemination of culture. There are many different models to explain how individuals get influenced by their neighbors, but they are in general based on a very simple idea, which is the fact that individuals tend to be more culturally alike when they interact. Think of it this way, if your group of friends really loves the Spice Girls, with time you will start liking it as well due to their constant influence, or at least that's how I became such a fan of the Spice Girls. With this principle of maximum likelihood in our mind, which we might call the Spice Girls phenomena, we can try and model how culture is spread. For that, we are going to need three main ingredients. First, let's consider a group of n people and let's label them with the numbers from 1 up to n. This group of individuals will be the society for our model. As happens in real life, not every individual is connected with each other, in the sense that not all individuals share information with one another. For example, you might be connected to your family and your friends, but surely not to some random person that lives in another country which you haven't talked in your life. We are going to call the group of people that a certain individual can interact with its neighbors. The set of people together with their neighbors is what we usually call a network. Thus, a network might be thought of in an abstract way by just points labeled with numbers and edges connecting pairs of points. In our example, points represent individuals and edges represent the relations between individuals. This is the second ingredient we needed. We have a society formed by individuals and connected by a network, and now we need to model their opinions. For that, we will make a very simple assumption, which is that people only care about a certain number of topics, let's call it F. For example, F could be 1. Politics, 2. Opinions about the prequels of Star Wars, and 3. Football teams. In this case, F equals 3, since there are 3 topics that people care about. And we will consider that for all of these different topics, individuals can choose to position themselves in a number, let's call it Q, of very differentiated opinions. For example, if Q equals 2, then people can think in a dichotomist way. Either they are right or left winged, they hate the prequels or only hate Jar Jar Binks, or they follow El Eibar or El Rayo Vallecano. This might be represented with a vector of three components that can only have two different values for each component. We can call this vector the personality of the individual. Now that we have all the ingredients we needed, it's time to talk about the dynamics. The dynamics of our system will be led by a rule in which individuals interact, the Spice Girls rule. As is usual in complex sciences, this rule is pretty simple, though it might explain very rich phenomena. To explain this rule better, let us focus on a particular example. 
We would suppose that our society is very simple and just formed by four individuals. On Sagar, Boltzmann, Landau and Batman. Wait. Batman's a scientist? It's not Batman! Well, not Batman, because he's not a scientist, and we have another B. Let's just put Cronenberg Batman, the Batman from the dimension in which everyone is a Cronenberg. In this dimension, Batman is a scientist, so everything works fine for our model. So, anyway, we have Onsager, Boltzmann, Landa, and Cronenberg Batman. For short, we will just name them O, B, L, and Z. For this example, we will suppose that everyone's friends with everyone. Thus, our network would be... Apart from the society and the network, we are going to need some initial personalities for the individuals. I say initial because remember that these personalities might switch throughout the simulation as a result of the agents exchanging information. We can give the society some personality values a priori based on information we might know, but we can also just give them random personalities. Remember that personalities are given by vectors of f dimensions that can take q different values. In our case, let us suppose f equals 3 and q equals 2. Then opinions are determined by three dimensional vectors that can only have two different values for each component. Now that we have initial personalities for our network, it's time to apply our rule. This clock here indicates time steps of our code. At every time step, we apply the rule to our system. This machine here is the DREAMS machine, a device I myself invented, that gives me random numbers with a probability p that I specify. You might be wondering how such a wonderful machine can work. Well, that will be the topic for another video, but I can anticipate you it's made with the same material of DREAMS, exactly, the illusion of randomness eluding all about Monte Carlo simulations. Okay, so what a rule does is, uh, for every time step, we choose one individual randomly, using the DREAMS machine with p equals 1 fifth. For example, in this case, the result is going to be Cronenberg Batman. We look at the neighbors of Cronenberg Batman, B, O and L, and choose one of them randomly. In this case, we get Onsager. Okay, now we look at shared aspect of the personalities of Onsager and Batman. This is the tricky part of the simulation. Remember when we talked about the maximum likelihood rule, also called the Spice Girls rule? Well, this is the time to apply it. We want to make Onsager and Cronenberg Batman interact with a probability proportional to how much their personalities are alike. What the Axelrod model proposes is to take the probability equal to the number of shared aspects of the personality divided by the total number of aspects, which we called F. Because Onsager and Cronenberg Batman have two equal aspects, and because F equals 3 in this case, the probability this model proposes is 2 thirds. Thus, the probability of C to change his personality to match that of O is just 2 thirds. Using the Dreams machine again, we found that Cronenberg Batman changes the last aspect of his personality to match that of Onsager. We might repeat the process again. Select one individual, in this case, Landau, and look at one of his neighbors, in this case, Onsager. We see that they don't have anything in common, so they won't exchange information. The probability to do so would be zero. Thus, we might move to the next step. Before we move further on, I don't think anyone likes this vector notation for the personalities, right? I mean, it's kind of difficult to visualize personalities with vectors. Maybe we can find a better way to do it. Well, in order to have something more visual, let us do the following. We take each vector and identify each of its components with the intensity of one of the primal colors, red, green and blue. Thus, if the opinion of Boltzmann's is 0, 0, 0, this means that his color has neither red, nor blue, nor green, it's a black color. Lambda otherwise has 0, 0, 1 as his personality, so his color will be totally blue. So, now we will arrange each individual blinking boxes, with colors representing their personalities. Let's simulate bigger examples! We have explained how the axle road model works. And we have seen a very simple example. Now it's time to move to a big society filled with people and try to simulate the process of counter dissemination. We could try to do this manually and using the drinks machine, but it would take us a long time. It's better if we use our computers to simulate the dynamics. We're going to take a society of 400 individuals and arrange it in a very regular network of 20 times 20 individuals, in which each individual is connected and hence shares information with only the nearest individuals, also called nearest neighbors. Let us see what happens for some different values of q. Remember that q was the number of different opinions one individual can have about a certain topic. If we take a small q, such as q equals 2, and run the simulation for different initial conditions, we see that we always reach a consensus, in the sense that society ends up thinking the same way. 
observed that the results of the dynamics are purely random, due to the fact that both the initial personalities and the dynamics follow stochastic rules. In the dynamics, we choose individuals at random and make them interact with a certain probability. That's why we see different results for the same value of q. Let's now move to a bigger value of q. For instance, let's take q equals 20. In this case, the simulation ends up very quickly, as the system can't evolve much farther from the initial conditions. This happens because for big Q, the probability of two individuals to interact is smaller. As there are many differentiated opinions for each topic, it will be very difficult for two individuals to share the same opinion. Think of it this way. If you ask two different persons what is their favorite band, because there are many different options, it's very unlikely that they will coincide on the same one. This means that the system quickly reaches a state in which individuals do not interact anymore. More. These kind of states are usually called frozen state. A frozen state is characterized by the fact that either individuals share the same opinion or they have very different ones. In both cases, individuals cannot interact and clusters with the same opinion are formed. A cluster is just a region of the network that shares the same personality values. We have seen that for large Q, the system seems to reach a much pluralized state, in which society shares a lot of different cultures and personalities. It's a multicultural society. On the other hand, for a small bonus of Q, the system reaches a state in which society is totally homogeneous. It's a monocultural society. A statistical physicists talk about phases when they refer to this intuitive idea of monocultural and multicultural society. Yes, like the gas, solid and liquid phase and all that stuff. They say that for a small bodies of Q, society is at a homogeneous phase where the monoculture prevails, and on the other hand, for big bodies of Q, society is at a heterogeneous phase where pluriculture domains. Thus, if we modify the value of Q, we can talk about the phase transition between a homogeneous phase and a heterogeneous phase. To measure the degree in which a society is multicultural or monocultural, complex scientists use a parameter called GCC, Greater Connected Component, which is the size of the biggest cluster that appears in the system, the size of the biggest homogeneous region. In statistical physics, a parameter that is used to characterize a phase transition is usually called an order parameter. In this case, the other parameter is the GCC, in the same way as in the ISIN model, the other parameter was the total magnetization. Well, I am actually going to use the size of the bigger cluster divided by the total number of the society, which is 400 in this case, as another parameter that is now ranging from 0 to 1. Now we are going to see some simulations for different values of Q, but with this bar right here indicating the value of the order parameter, the normalized size of the biggest cluster. Observe that this value seems to decay abruptly with Q when Q is greater than 10. This is precisely the phase transition we were talking about before. This phase transition can be visualized by representing the curve of the cluster size as a function of Q, which is this one right here. These lines over each point are called error bars. Remember when we said that the results of the simulations are purely random? This means that the size of the biggest cluster is a parameter that will vary from realization to realization. In order to have results that are statistically meaningful, we took the results from several realizations and averaged them. These error bars indicate how much the different realizations fluctuate from the average value. For example, for Q equals 12, we see that the cluster size is between 0.4 and 0.8 most of the times, with different values for each realization. In this case, we can see a continuous variation of the order parameter from big values which indicates a homogeneous society occurring for a small Q, to small values which indicate a heterogeneous society occurring for large Q. The phase transition is continuous because we are working on a finite size system, a society of only 20 times 20 individuals. Statistical physicists usually deal with phase transition in what they call thermodynamic limit. This implies supposing n going up to infinity. In this article, Binary and Multivariate Stochastic Models of Consensus Formation by Maxi San Miguel, Victor Eguiluz, Raúl Toral and Constantin Klem, there are graphs for different values of n. Observe that when n grows bigger, the transition becomes sharper. In the limit, it would be a discontinuous phase transition. By the way, and now that this video is ending, I just wanted to say that the point in which a phase transition occurs is also called CRITICAL POINT. So, that's it for today. If you like the video, you can just subscribe to our channel, or you can just wait for other people you know to do so, and Spice Girl Phenomena will get you at some point.